Welcome to Canon Conversation number 871. This is number five in our advanced Christian series. Today we're going to talk about communion. Communion is observed by pretty much every Christian church. Uh, I know Salvation Army does not. There may be another denomination that does not observe it, but everybody else does. So we're going to talk about uh, you know why. Because when you look at Scripture, first off, you do see Jesus when he observed it with his disciples. He did not. It was not called communion. It was not called the Lord's Supper. It was called Passover. God instituted uh, a yearly feast called the Passover feast for Israel, and the reason is because God sent ten plagues upon Egypt to get Pharaoh to let Israel go, and the last plague was called the Passover. Well, the last plague was called the death of the firstborn, which means the firstborn son, the firstborn cattle, firstborn everything in that house would be killed when there would be a death angel that would go over Egypt and then kill the firstborn of each household. And But for Israel, they were told to sacrifice a lamb, firstborn without spot or wrinkle, and to take it, um, take the blood from the lamb and put it over the doorpost of the house there. And then when the death angel came by, he would pass over that house and not kill them, not kill the firstborn. So that's where you get to pass it. The idea of Passover is they're going to pass over and not kill the firstborn. And the reason God had it done that way is because it's to show that Israel, he said in Exodus 4, when he had Moses bring Israel out of Egypt before he even started the plagues, he said, Israel is my firstborn. So what he's saying then is God is saying, I'm going to save my firstborn, which is Israel. They're my people. So uh, he has them put that blood over the doorpost. And that's a sign because when Jesus came in John 1, 29, I think it was, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So the lamb that was sacrificed and the blood put over the doorpost and the death angel passing over Israel is a sign of the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would shed his blood. And if you have believed the gospel, then that blood is applied to your soul and then the death angel passes over you. You would have eternal life in God's kingdom. So that's the purpose behind all that. And when Jesus, since Jesus came as the ultimate Passover lamb, he was sacrificed on Passover. And so Jesus, before he went to the cross, had the Passover feast with his disciples. And he says, with desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. Because he knew this would be the last one before the ultimate Passover was that he was about to sacrifice his own flesh for forgiveness of their sins. And so in that Passover meal, then he would say, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he says, for the cup as well, this is the blood of my New Testament. So then you would eat the lamb and drink or bread or whatever it is to eat and then you drink the uh, the wine that was part of the Passover ceremony and then that would symbolize Jesus uh, his death for their sins so that's where it started then what happened was uh, God changed dispensations when it came to Paul in Acts chapter 9 and you know some things that God had instituted a lot of things they were under that Mosaic Law, were done away with under, um, under the new dispensation of grace with Paul. But what God had Paul do was take that Passover ceremony, because Passover was distinctly for Israel. The death angel passed over Israel's house because they had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And so what, uh, what God has 
us do, or I should say Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, he doesn't refer to it as Passover. Jesus referred to it as Passover. But what he refers to is it's the Lord's Supper. Paul says it's the Lord's Supper. And it's not observed on the, I think it's the 15th day of the first month, I think it was, was the Passover day. Uh, that's not, there is no once a year set in stone date for the Lord's Supper. And you see in 1 Corinthians 11, what Paul does is again repeat the words of Jesus about the, the bread. Uh, take this, this do in remembrance of me, the, the lamb, uh, not the lamb, the, uh, the wine. And he's he says that uh, basically the first thing to note though, so there is no Passover on the 15th day of the first month anymore because that was for Israel's program, but there is a Lord's Supper. And the first thing to note is it's not the Lord's snack, it's the Lord's Supper. It's a meal. The Passover was a specific meal that they had, and the Lord's Supper is a specific meal. So what churches do with communion is they are taking a bite of a cracker and a drink of grape juice, and that is uh, how they observe communion. But you don't see that anywhere in Scripture. What you see is a Passover meal, a full meal, where they sacrificed a lamb with Israel's program, starting when God led Israel, starting with the death of the firstborn, the tenth plague on Egypt. And they avoided that with that uh, with the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. And then Jesus has them have the, uh, again, Passover meal, just like the normal meal. But it's specifically done just before his death because his death is going to be on Passover. Because he is the ultimate Passover lamb. Then with, uh, so basically what you have there with the Passover meal is that you are looking forward to the time when your sins will be forgiven by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ being shed for you. That, that it was a foreshadowing of that when God has Israel do it once a year and when Jesus did it just before he went to the cross. Again, a foreshadowing of what was about to happen. But now, now we're past the cross. Jesus has already died, buried, and rose again as atonement for sin, and we're not part of Israel's program. God did not lead us through the Red Sea. He did not send plagues upon a nation to get, you know, God did not send 10 plagues upon Great Britain to free us from their rule, and we became the United States of America. And we didn't sprinkle blood over the doorpost. Uh, we are not spiritual Israel. We're not physical Israel. We're not connected to Israel at all. Really, the only connection is Jesus Christ was a was a Jew, and he was a minister of the circumcision, and and so um, you know it was a Jewish man, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. But uh, that's pretty much it when it comes to the, the our connections to Israel. But then what God does, and with with the new dispensation of grace with Paul is he says, it's not going to be a Passover, because that's for Israel, but you can have a Lord's Supper. And it doesn't have to be on the 15th day of the first month of the year. You could have it once a year at a certain day. You could have it every month. Uh, you know, a lot, Some churches will have communion once a week. Some will have it once every three months. Some will have it once a month. Some once every six months. You know, it, they, they pick whatever they want. But notice it's not communion, it's not the Lord's snack, it's the Lord's supper. And what you do now in the dispensation of grace that's different is, see, Israel, according to 1 Peter 1, 9, and also Acts 3, 19 through 21, is that Israel does not receive the atonement for their sins until Jesus' second coming. That's why you get passages of conditional salvation. Because Revelation 14, 9 through 11 says that if they take the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast, they're going to have their place in the lake of fire. So God couldn't say, well, you're forgiven of all your sins, you're justified now, you've got the atonement now, and then later on they bow down to the image. Well, then God would be a liar. If God says you're now justified, you've got eternal life, but yet he 
then uh, takes it away from you because you bow down to the image, then he just lied. He said you had eternal life, but you don't because now he took it away because you bow down to the image. Or vice versa, he could say uh, you have eternal life and then you bow down to the image and he does not take that away from you. But he said in Revelation 14, 9 through 11 that those who take to bow down to the image of the beast who take the mark would have their place in the lake of fire. So uh, either way, God cannot give eternal security to Israel, believing Israel, until Jesus' second coming. That's why Matthew 10, Matthew 24 says, Jesus says you must endure to the end. That's why Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says that they could lose their salvation. So uh, it's a different set of circumstances. But for us, Romans 5, 9 says we have now been justified by his blood. Romans 5, 11 says we have now received the atonement. 2 Timothy 2, round verse 13 says that if we believe not, so we've already recognized our sin and trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin, but then we decide that we are not, um, we just abandon it. We say the Bible's full of lies. We don't believe, you know, we believe it was all a myth. We were duped and Jesus didn't really die on a cross for our sins. He really uh, got away and married Ma Mary Magdalene and moved to France and had some kids. So we believe that all that stuff about Jesus dying for our sins is all a lie. Well, 2 Timothy 2.13 says that even if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. The moment you recognize your sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, uh, God takes you out of Adam and he places you into Christ. And 1 Corinthians 15, around verse 21, says, In Christ shall all be made alive. So what that does then is, since Israel has conditional salvation and they don't have forgiveness of sins until Jesus' second coming, but we have uh, eternal life and forgiveness of sins the moment we believe the gospel, then that changes the emphasis of the Lord's Supper. And that's why it's called Lord's Supper versus Passover. I mean, think about the terms. Passover means that the death angel is going to pass over me. The implication is, if he's going to come once a year, because you're doing the Passover once a year, then the implication is that I need to do another Passover the next year. I don't have forget eternal forgiveness of sins. It's conditional. And you look at the nation, that's what it was. The day of Yom Kippur, the 10th day of the, of the year, the day of atonement, is when the high priest would bring the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and cover the sins of the people. And that's why, not too long after that, you've got the Passover. And so then God would say, okay, we're not, I'm not gonna destroy Israel. I'm gonna pass over them because I don't see sin on their flesh because of the Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. So you have uh, basically you're passed over for that year. And then the next year, you're gonna have to be passed over again. Every year you gotta be passed over from having um, that death angel basically kill you for being in unbelief. <laughs> but for us in the dispensation of grace, since we've already, that it's not the blood of a lamb, firstborn, first year without any blemish. Uh, it's not the, the blood of a lamb that is applied to us, uh, to our flesh. It is the blood of Christ applied to our souls. And so, we have eternal life right now. We have no sin on us. Now, we can sin in our flesh, but because our flesh has been spiritually circumcised from our soul or cut off from our soul, then the body of sins has been destroyed. So if, I shouldn't say if, I should say when, when I sin in my flesh, it never reaches my soul because the blood of Christ has already covered all my sins, past, present, and future. I've already got the atonement. You don't have to recognize Jesus' death every single year on the Passover or every single time you come to church in order to have life, in order to make sure you get passed over from death because you're already living. You, Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And Jesus has already given you his life the moment you recognize your sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. 
So that's why the term has changed. When Jesus had it with his disciples, he had it every year, of course it's not recorded there, but that's what he did because that's what God required in the Mosaic law. So, and we know Jesus never sinned, so you know that Jesus had Passover uh, every single year of his life on the day it was prescribed. And he had that Passover meal. But now in the dispensation of grace, we don't call it Passover because the moment you're saved, you've been passed over and the death angel never comes over you again because you've already been judged to have eternal life. You've been justified now by his blood. You've received atonement right now. You've received, God has blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you. He's forgiven you of all your trespasses. So you don't have to go once a year on the 15th day of the first month to have a lamb sacrificed and partake in that and put the blood over the doorpost in order to have uh, forgiveness of sins because you've already got forgiveness by the blood of Christ and it's an eternal sacrifice once for all which we'll talk about later when we get to what the Catholics do so that's why the term has changed no need to call it Passover because God doesn't pass over you or the death angel doesn't pass over you and not kill you because you sacrificed a lamb and put the blood over the doorpost. What he did was he's already done it through the cross of Christ and it's, uh, it's an eternal uh, purging of your sins. So then it's called the Lord's Supper. Well, what's a supper? You, you think of Revelation chapter 3, I think it is, when he's talking to one of the, uh, Jesus talking to one of the churches. And he says, um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, meaning he's standing to judge Israel, uh, getting ready for that. It's there, the kingdom is in the at hand phase at the time. I stand at the door and knock. If you invite me in, he says, I will come in and sup with you. Sup, supper, really, what it means is you're getting together, uh, together, people getting together over a meal. And that is supper, basically. The word supper really means fellowship over a meal. You're supping with the person. You're fellowshipping with them over a meal. So by the term, it's, and it's called the Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. Because all of us that we have believed the gospel, we're taken out of Adam, we're placed in Christ. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. God doesn't recognize our flesh, but Ephesians 1, 6, we are, it says we are accepted in the Beloved. And the Beloved is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have, uh, when God looks at us, he sees Christ. So let's say you have 25 people and they're sitting down for a meal. Then it's called a, a supper. You know, in the, in the South anyway, that's what you do. You'd have... You wouldn't have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You'd have breakfast, dinner, and supper. And supper is that last meal of the day. It's really a, and the reason they call it supper is because it's a, a fellowshipping time. Because you can't really do that with the breakfast because you gotta, you gotta just eat and get to work. And at lunch, that's sort of your break. You gotta eat again. You come in from the, the field where you've been working hard and you just sort of, you gotta replenish your fuel, get that food going, and then you go back out there in that field. But when you get to the supper meal, the last meal of the day, you don't have to go back in that field and work, but you can relax. And so the word the supper is used because it's more of a, a fellowship time. Uh, the supper meal would be smaller. The, the dinner meal is where you really eat because you've worked half of the day and you got a half to go. So you need some fuel to get going. So uh, breakfast and dinner are the big meals, but supper is more like now you're sitting together with everybody because now the wife can relax at least for a little bit while, <laughs> while you're eating. And uh, the kids, they're there, you're there, uh, the wife is there, everybody's there, and you're just enjoying each other's company. You're supping with them. Well, so that's what a supper is. It's eating and fellowshipping over a meal. Well, the reason it's called the Lord's Supper is because the Lord is in me and the Lord is in you and the Lord is in every person at that meal. So normally you would say, well, it's, you know, let's say it's the Newmans, you know, say I say I have a wife and two kids and I work a farm, then I'm going to have the Newman's Supper 
at the end of the day. It's the Newmans getting together at the end of the day, the whole family, and we're eating. And we're fellowshipping with each other. Well, when you are in Christ and all of us together, our family name isn't the Newmans. It's the Lord. The Lord is in me. The Lord's in you. The commonality, the way it makes it a, us a family, is because the Lord is there. It's the Lord in each of us. So it's the Lord's family. So when we sup with each other and we're all in the Lord, then it's the Lord's Supper. And so that's what Paul is talking about. It's not the Passover, but it's the Lord's Supper. And the idea, and he flips the thing from a physical to a spiritual application in 1 Corinthians 11 because it's a spiritual sacrifice. Jesus' soul was made an offering for sin and his blood applies to your soul. Therefore, uh, when you get together, the way we are the Lord's is we're all spiritually. The Lord is the one who took us dead in our trespasses and sins and made our spirits alive in Christ. So now we've got the Lord's spirit supping with each other there and it's the Lord's Supper. That's our fellowship. And then he flips it in 1 Corinthians 11 to say, he says, as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Well, you're showing the Lord's death, meaning you don't show that Jesus died just by drinking some grape juice. You show the Lord's death by how you live. And so when you come together and fellowship over sound doctrine in a, in a meal setting, what you're doing is you're getting edified in the spirit. Because remember, it's the Lord's Supper and the Lord's in your spirit. So you're getting edified in the spirit. And then you apply the sound doctrine using the mind of Christ in life as you go about your, your day. And then what you're doing is you're showing the Lord's death. You're showing Christ has changed you through his death. And, uh, and so the Lord's Supper is a time of getting together and fellowshipping over what the Lord has done. So the first thing to note is uh, communion is never found anywhere in Scripture. It's a full meal. It was a Passover under Israel's program because they didn't have forgiveness of sins. So the, pass, the Passover focused on not being killed. The Lord's Supper focuses on who you are in Christ, your life in Christ. So we sup or we fellowship together over who we are in Christ. Thanks for watching.